Hey again, it's Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez with Performance Place, and we're going to go over uh, the third part of our conversation or uh, seminar on, mini seminar on FAI of the hip or an impingement, that impingement or pinching that a lot of people feel on the front side of their hip. Um, this is a really, really common uh, problem I've seen, especially in very active people, uh, lifters, crossfitters, runners, um, gosh, dancers, there's, there's a lot of people that have this. Um, and it's something that is actually fairly new uh, in regards to uh, sports medicine. So there's not a lot of people that actually can identify it or know a lot of the uh, aspects of it. So I'm here to educate you on that. Um, just like any of the other podcasts, if you find that there's something wrong, if there's something that I uh, said incorrectly, feel free to let me know. Um, these are all, I don't want to say non-scripted, but they're... Not off the top of my head either, but I'm looking at stuff in front of the computer screen, and sometimes I happen to say the wrong thing. So I want to make sure that you guys get the right information. So uh, this part is on how the SI joint, or if you don't know what the SI joint is, um, it is the sacroiliac joint and how it has a strong correlation with, or could have a strong correlation with FAI of the hip. FAI, again, is femoral acetabular impingement of the hip. Um, so all along the way here, I strongly suggest that you pause this thing uh, and Google these structures because learning anatomy is going to be really, really, really important in regards to how well you understand the conditions that you have. Um, through some of the uh, self-help and education things that I'm going to start putting out here, um, it's going to go over anatomy, mechanics, uh, proper diagnosis, what type of imaging you can use to uh, figure these things out or at least go into your healthcare provider and say, hey, this is something that I think I have. Uh, what do you think about these ideas? So we can have a good, educated conversation. So going on with the SI joint here, the main concern is what we call acetabular retroversion. And uh, I know you guys aren't going to understand what that means probably, but just understand that it, it involves orientation of the ball and socket. Um, and the ball and socket, just like the shoulder, the hip has one. It's, it's pretty compact. Um, the, the, the socket, which direction it's oriented, is going to correlate to what we call, again, acetabular retroversion. Um, retroversion is more or less the positioning of the socket is rather poor. Um, it's actually posterior and lateral or back and to the side rather than being more forward facing, um, which is a better positioning for the bond socket to move freely, freely uninhibited, unimpinged. So a lot of times when you have uh, poor movement uh, or poor positioning of things like this uh, anominate bone or, and the, sorry, the anominate bone is actually the uh, collective name for three of the bones of one side of the pelvis. You can look that one up as well. If it has poor positioning, it eventually leads to pinching uh, small tearing and sometimes large tearing of the uh, acetabular labrum or the labrum in the hip, which is a cartilage. Um, <clears throat> how do you position this anominate bone or position the, the ball and socket in the correct orientation? Um, you know, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, it's going to take a lot of almost just laying in there and uh, figuring out how to move your pelvis correctly. Um, I always thought, at least first working with people with this, that we can just strengthen the um, supporting muscles around the area and just let them go. But I didn't realize that actually a lot of these people... They don't know how to actually move their limbs. They might not move their pelvis. They can't fixate their core. There's there's certain small movements that they can't that they haven't uh, they've forgotten how to do. They might have known how to do it before, but um, just like Grandma used to say, if you don't use it, you lose it, and and that's true in this case. Uh, in a in a more uh, clinical setting, we call these things movement patterns. Uh, I don't even want to go into. Um, theory on those, but for the most part, if you use it, if you don't use it, you lose it, and to get it back is just going to take a lot of hard work, dedication, and, and some know-how of figuring out what you should do. Um, there was a study that I, uh, I looked at with um, correlation of the SI joint, or um, again, you can we can substitute that that name with the anominate bone if we want to be very general about it. But um, the study I would look up is, uh, quote-unquote, is uh, sacroiliac joint dysfunction as a reason for development of acetabular retroversion, uh, a new theory. So this one is in 2013. I thought it was a good little read. 
um, but it posed the uh, situation where um, they were theorizing that acetabular retroversion uh, or poor placement of the pelvis uh, develops this impingement or FAI, femoral acetabular impingement, um, also hip osteoarthritis, so there's abnormal wear and tear on the, on the bone socket itself. So uh, take away from this, I know this one is a little bit more complicated than the other uh, podcasts that I've put out on this topic, but try to look up those words. Uh, some of the things like acetabular retroversion are going to be a little too complex for a lot of people to understand because there is a, it's a three-dimensional type of movement. Um, but understand the structures, understand, understand the, the SI joint, understand the anominate bone or the ilium, look up those things, you'll find them all, um, probably some good pictures on it. And understand the uh, acetabular um, labrum or the, or the labrum down on the hip um, and see how these things are actually very correlated, how the pelvis moves, how the anominate or SI joint moves. Um, it actually, the analogy I give a lot of people... Um, Visually, uh, at least when they have this in my office, I have a, a pelvis uh, that moves a lot, and I show them what it looks like to have poor position and optimal, optimal position. And, and actually, there's a test called Scour's test that um, the person is on their back on the table, and you take their hip, and you put it in a flexion or their knee to, towards their chest, and you kind of roll it around. Um, and essentially, if you if you look at a pelvis model and you see what it position uh, the socket takes if you go into a better position, you understand, a lot of people do understand that that test would not hurt as much just based upon um, pure mechanics of the joint and just seeing that the rim of the, of the, of the socket raises. So um, think of it as, um, think of it as a lot of work. I was going to go into another, another analogy, but it's, it's, it's not probably going to help you guys out. So it's a lot of work. Uh, you might want to work with someone who cues you in uh, core stabilization and figuring out really body orientation. Those are going to be the first things to do on this. Uh, all right, I hope we didn't bore you guys through this one, but um, uh, listen to the other ones. Uh, this is stuff that I've, I've spent a lot of time putting together. Um, the article that I'm referencing, referencing on my site, um, if you look up FAI hip and labral tears, You'll find this article on p2sportscare.com. Uh, it's, it's the seven uh, things that I thought were very interesting in regards to research, um, uh, really recent research on uh, hips. And uh, I put it together, and it took me a long time to proofread and make it so it's understandable. But it was one of the best articles I think that I wrote, um, and I think it'll help a lot of people if you read it. So uh, take care, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Feel free to find us on Instagram. That is at... Uh, Performance HB on Instagram and on Twitter, it is the exact same thing. All right, I'll talk to you guys soon.